A very warm welcome, Mr. Rogoff. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. In your book, This Time is Different, you analyzed the consistent patterns of financial market crises. What are the main patterns in the course of such a crisis? Well, I think one thing to mention is in my book with Carmen Reinhardt, we look at different kinds of crises. We look at debt crises, uh, which affect emerging markets mainly, but in the past affected advanced economies. We look at inflation crises, exchange rate crises, and banking crises, financial crises. And of these, the markers are different, but uh, say inflation crises build up very slowly. You can see them coming. They don't tend to happen overnight. With uh, the other kinds, particularly with financial crises, it's very hard, they're very hard to predict. The patterns that we find uh, are much sharper afterwards. And I, I like to use the analogy, uh, forgive me, of uh, a heart disease. Mm -hmm. So you can seem perfectly healthy, but you have a stroke or a heart attack. You can seem like by every measure it should happen tomorrow and it never does. And I think with financial crises, it's like that. Uh, so some of the markers certainly are, uh, you know, a fast run up in borrowing, uh, ri rising, sharply rising housing prices, um, current account deficits are things you can look at, but it's very hard to predict. After it happens, now it depends if it's a ordinary financial crisis or what we call a systemic one, which really affects the whole economy, that, then the patterns are painfully much clearer of very slow growth, collapses in asset markets, and I, I think things that are, uh, are very familiar. Mm -hmm. But they're not easy to predict. One thing, which certainly is a marker of many financial crises and debt crises, are sharply rising interest rates. Not so, of course, they're sharply inter rising interest rates for whoever is about to default, but world interest rates. Mm -hmm. And that's, some, that's something, you know, that obviously hasn't happened yet. Um, if we're talking about uh, who's vulnerable to financial crises, now it's clearly the emerging markets who didn't really have a crisis in 2008, 2009. <clears throat> we call it the global financial crisis, but it was really the advanced economy financial crisis. And the emerging markets didn't do the same reforms that were done in the advanced economies. Now during the pandemic, Uh, they have done many of the same uh, necessary actions to protect their people, to protect the economy, but they don't have necessarily the space. So mm -hmm. just as an example, housing moratoria where you don't have to pay rents, they're doing that in a lot of emerging markets and ultimately the banks will have to pay, the government will have to pay, but of course they don't have the, the mm -hmm. same resources. So the bottom line is unfortunately, they're very hard to predict The fact that interest rates are very, very low at the moment, uh, you know, may, means if you're having a problem, which some countries are, a number of countries, smaller uh, emerging markets are, um, you really have problems. So I'm afraid that's as far as our book goes. During the corona period, worldwide debt of states, enterprises and households has risen by another 30 percentage points in relation to GDP. According to your book and later research, What problems or dangers might this cause? And are the risks different for advanced economies as opposed to emerging markets? So first of all, 30% is a global average and hides a lot of differences across countries. But it's very different for advanced economies. So what we argue in our book is that advanced economies appear to have graduated from having uh, systemic debt crises, sovereign debt crises that they've graduated. Uh, I don't know how, what you want to call Greece, uh, is clearly a borderline advanced economy, but the, the most of the advanced economies who have higher per capita incomes have not had these since you know, the, the, 20th, the first half of the 20th century mostly, maybe some IMF programs, but not full-blown debt crises. Emerging markets is another matter. They've uh, happened quite a bit in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. Curiously, not so much after the global financial crisis, although it has started to emerge. But I mean, clearly that's where the vulnerabilities are in emerging markets. And I've, 
continue to do work on this, uh, also with Carmen Reinhardt uh, and other co-authors. And it, uh, clear, the interest rates are very low at the moment. So although we have more uh, defaults than at any time since uh, the early 2000s, it's still the frontier emerging markets, the lower income emerging markets. There's Argentina, mm-hmm. um, you know, Suriname, uh, Lebanon uh, have, have, are in uh, debt crises. Mm-hmm. But I, I think for advanced economies, it's simply, uh, it affects having really high debts, not desirable, but in this environment of very, very low interest rates, they have fallen. 350 percent, uh, the basis points, three and a half percent since we wrote our book. It's the sharpest drop in peacetime that we've seen. Um, it provides a, a very benign environment as long as they stay so low. In 2020, you wrote a present research paper, Peak China Housing, showing that China had become overly dependent on real estate and real estate related activities for growth. Do you envision that the Evergrande crisis could be the start of a financial crisis in China? So when people look at China, they tend to think of, can layman happen in China? Can they have a financial crisis just like in the West? And my um, paper uh, last year was published uh, this year with um, Yuan Chen Yang, uh, who's now at the International Monetary Fund. We argued that's not the right way to look at it. The right way to look at it is more as a Soviet-style problem or what happened in Japan. A layman-type crisis isn't as big a challenge for China basically because the government controls everything. They don't have to deal with the political fallout the same way. They don't have to deal with the courts. They, Yes, they have constraints, but they can basically allocate the losses very quickly and move on. But what they can't do is if they've been overbuilding in the housing sector for a very long time, they can't easily shift their economy to sustain fast growth that they've been doing. And what we showed in the paper is that uh, the scale of the productive side, the, the footprint in GDP is very large in housing. And if housing uh, activity broadly defined to include real estate, furniture, real estate uh, activities that were declined, it could have really quite a dramatic effect on overall Chinese GDP. And I think another element we found is not just that it's big, but that they built a lot. So we've all who, of us who've been to China, which of course has not been recently, um, you know, you see the, uh, the bullet trains, you see the incredible roads, airports, the buildings in the big cities, and it's remarkable they're, what they've done. But that's going on all over China. They've been doing it for a long time. So the analogy to the Soviet Union is, of course, they were very good at building uh, steel plants and railroads and subways and, yes, some not very attractive concrete buildings. But when they ran out of things to build, that's really partly what put them into trouble. Japan's a later example, the bridges to nowhere, whereas China, to some extent, in the third and fourth tier cities has houses no one lives in. And uh, I mean, the Chinese authorities are amazing what they accomplished. One never wants to uh, discount them, but it's, it's quite a challenge to make this transition from a housing real estate driven economy to a more normal one. And my paper with Wang Chen uh, Yang makes the point that if this has gotten very big, it's gotten bigger faster than you can possibly imagine, and maybe is not so easy to deal with, even if they can contain the immediate financial crisis. Many thanks for all those valuable insights, Mr. Rogoff. Thank you very much.